no attention to that. It's kind of hard to, like bright green and shiny. Okay, so today we are starting electrostatics, but I want you to not think about that just yet. I want to jump back, way back into the day, last semester. I mean, this is like six years ago, right? Long, long time ago. And you have a, uh, a carp here, and there's a donkey. That's a donkey, okay. And that donkey is pulling the cart this way. Let me draw a better donkey. I can't really draw. I'm horrible at drawing donkeys. Okay, that's. You could add a few sticks or lights. Well, but you're looking at the top. The legs are underneath it. Okay. You hear a bird Sorry. flying over this. Okay. Meanwhile, you've got another donkey over here. And this donkey's pulling it this way. This has a mass of 10 kilo. Oh, wait, we better make it 100 kilograms. And this donkey is pulling with a force of uh, 200 newtons. And this donkey is pulling with a force of 200 newtons. And my question for you is. This car doesn't have wheels, it's really more of a pallet. Which way does the pallet go, and how fast does it accelerate? Kind of in the middle somewhere? Yeah, where? Um, in between the two? Where? Like, how do you know that? Well, I can just think about what happens if you pull in something in two different directions. Okay, so you're looking at it logically, yeah. and you're saying, well, if I push this this way, and I push this this way, it's going to go that way. Yes, it can. And it's going to go yeah. kind of crooked. Yeah. This is true. Your intuition serves you well this time. Don't always trust your intuition, though. <clears throat> Barring intuition, how would we figure this out? Math. It would indeed be math. And how do we, what is this math? This was last Art. semester. What's that? R. No. Split vectors and that kind of thing. Yes. Dealing with vectors. <sighs> oh, dreaded vectors. Okay, so what do we do? Um. This donkey is pulling straight north. This donkey is pulling straight east. Well, it's going to be half of that, so like 90 degrees, it's going to be, um... How do you add vectors? You split them. Well, not exactly. You find them. those. You're going to break them down to their x and y components. Yes, sir. Okay. Add them. How much of this is x component? Zero. All of it. All of it. This is all x. How much of this is x component? This is none of it. How much of this is Y component? All. Okay, so broken down. That's, that's good. Broken down. This is all at Y, this is all X. Okay, good. Now what? Can you subtract them from each other? No. Add them together? No. Add them from each other? No. Uh, Why? <laughs> 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 you like to grab another random thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you get the equations that we learned last semester, if you can remember them. Yes, exactly, and that's the point of what we're trying to do right now. Okay. Trying to get you, rather than grabbing at straws in the air, deep way, grab way back in your memory banks and pull it out. How do we do this again? Uh, you have to always add head to tail, okay? So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna draw this vector, I'm gonna put it down here. I'm going to take this vector and I'm going to put it right here so that the tail of this vector is at the head of that vector. Okay? Oh. Okay? Now what do we do? Where's the resultant? It's going to be lying in between from the head of the, of the top one and the tail of the bottom. Yeah, other way around, actually. From this one to that one. So the result goes this way. So this is our resultant vector. And then this is a force, it's a vector. This is a force, it's a vector, and this resultant is also a vector. And what were you saying? Um, we find the theta for the angles. Okay, so we're going to have to find this angle. How do we do that? So good. So good. 
<laughs> Bad memories. Okay, so Katoa. Now what? After that, I draw a blank. <laughs> Me too. Um, okay, what, what side of the triangle is this? Adjacent? Yes, how do you know that? It's next to theta. It's touching the angle, therefore it, this is the adjacent side. Okay, so I'm going to put in a little parentheses over here. A, because this side is adjacent. What side is this? Opposite. It's opposite. How do you know that? It's opposite. Yeah. Okay, so the angle is here. This is opposite of it, so this is the opposite side. And this side is the longest side on any triangle is always the... Hypotenuse? This is the hypotenuse. So I'm going to put hypotenuse. And X and Y are necessarily always perpendicular because that's what makes them X and Y. Right? Okay, so these two are perpendicular. Okay, so which two sides do we know? Uh, adjacent and opposite. We know adjacent and opposite. So which of our functions are we going to use? Toa. We want Toa, because it's the only one that has both of those in it. So this tells us that the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. Okay, so the tangent of theta is opposite, which is 200, divided by the adjacent, which is 200, Okay, how do we get theta? Uh, we divide it, uh, we multiply it by uh, arc sign. No, no arc tangent. Okay, yeah, we, 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 it's actually not multiply, we, we say we take arc tangent of both sides. Uh, okay. okay, so we're going to take arc tangent of all this, and arc tangent of all this, and so we get theta is equal to the arc tangent of. 200 over 200, which is just 1, which is 45. 45 degrees. So I guess 45 degrees was right. Yes. But now you know it's right. Yeah. It's not just a guess. Yeah. Okay. Now, so that's the direction of it. That's which way it's going to go. My next question was, how fast is it going to accelerate? Second law. Wait, 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 wait. What are doing all three of his laws? Uh, law number one. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> uh, See, so or something in motion tends to stay in motion. Yeah. Bingo. Unless action on. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless. Action on by an equal. An form. outside force. Yeah. Or an object at rest and stay at rest unless. Act upon by an outside force. Act upon by an outside force. Okay, that's law number one. Law number two. So the forces. That's it. What is it? Um, uh, F you already said some of the forces. Equals uh, mass. No. Yeah? Okay. Um, times velocity? No, 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 no. A. Acceleration. Okay. <clears throat> Law number three. Yes, that's okay. it. What is it? Um, uh, For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You can restate this by saying, identify the nouns in flip flop. Remember when we talked about that? Fist hits table. What are the nouns in that sentence? Uh -huh. Fist and table. Fist and table. Identify the nouns in flip flop. Fist hits table, therefore, Table, table hits fist. Equal and opposite reaction. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, the question is, what is the acceleration of this pallet? Hmm. Look, you were there. Acceleration. Ooh, ooh, that's what we need. We're given mass, 100 kilograms. We got this. If only we knew force. The net force. Well, wait a second, which force do we use? Those two? So it's going to be... No, we need the net force. How are we going to get that net force? Adding them together? No. Okay. <laughs> um, use the triangle. Um, this sign right here is the net force of those two. How do you find the hypotenuse? A 
squared plus b squared equals c squared. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Or you could use there is you can do it there with Sokotoa as well. Yeah. But let's do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So our resultant is the net force is the square root of 200 squared plus 200 squared, which is um, 80,000. Uh, no, no, no. Take square root. Uh, 282.84. 282.84. Okay, so our resultant force, our answer is this, the net force on this pallet is this way. It's going to pull it with 282 newtons, 84 newtons, and this angle is at 45 degrees, okay? So now we know force. We now know this. How are we going to get acceleration? We divide by mass. Divide both sides by mass. Okay, so take that, divide it by 100. You know, you're calculating for this, right? There you go. Um, what is acceleration? 28 point. No. Oh, yeah. 2.82 <laughs> meters per second squared. This. Very vaguely. Yeah. Is it starting to come back a little bit? Yeah. Very, okay. very little. I kind of wish it wasn't coming back. <laughs> okay. It needs to come back. Yeah. <clears throat> it's good for you. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, that was just an aside. Put it back aside now. Let's go back to what we're talking about today static electricity, otherwise known as electrostatics. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? Stuff that once you wiggle your clothes after they put in the dryer. Um, You're thinking about static electricity. What does static mean? Stationary. Static means not moving. And what does electricity refer to? Zap. <laughs> it refers electrons. to electrons. So static electricity would be. Electrons that are stationary? Electrons that are moving. Fair enough. Okay. Um, as a side note, if you want to move charges, well, let's, let me rephrase it this way. You've got a, um, a fully loaded train car loaded with scrap iron. Have you seen train cars? Fully loaded with scrap iron. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of massive. Okay. And right beside it, you've got uh, a cute little gerbil in its cage on a skateboard on a smooth concrete. Okay. Now, which is going to be easier for you to move? The cute little gerbil in its cage on the skateboard on the smooth concrete, or the fully loaded train car with scrap iron? The gerbil. Why? Smaller, lighter, less massive. Yeah. That's what the second law is all about, right? The, the less mass you have, the quicker it's going to accelerate. You can accelerate the big old honking train car, it's just the acceleration won't be very much. Okay? So, with that said, a proton is about 2,000 times more massive than an electron. 2,000 times more massive. So it's like the sun, it's like us compared to the sun, like the Earth compared to the sun. Yeah, yeah pretty close. So, uh, here's the thing. Almost always, you move electrons. If you're moving charges, you're moving electrons, not protons. It is possible to move protons, but it's not the primary way. What are protons used for? Protons used for them if you don't move them. Um, if, you mean, if you do have to move, then what are they useful? for? Uh, that guy right there, Ernest Rutherford. Uh, he shot protons 
oh, about pairs of protons actually, and uh, shot them at gold foil and uh, discovered the shape of an atom, which, as long as we're talking about it, is more or less shaped like this, uh, actually less like this, but this is the idea anyway, okay? Uh, in the middle, you've got what we call the nucleus, and the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. And they're all stuck together. You get the idea of not to draw anymore. Okay. And flying around on the outside of this are electrons. Kind of ish. What's that? Kind of ish. Mm -hmm. This is a very, this is called uh, the Bohr model. I'm, I'm thinking back to something I learned in general, general science. Mm -hmm. Is it true that this idea has kind of been thrown out the window and the whole idea of like the like general area or something? Yeah. The whole balloon model? Yeah. Although this, uh, this kind of works. It works in a lot of cases. Now, here's the, here's the catch. Can we see one of these things? They're way too small to see. Even with the best microscopes in the world, you cannot see an atom. At best, you can see a bump where an atom would be. But you can't see an atom. So when we say this is what it looks like, and we say this isn't what it looks like, does anybody, I mean, you see one? Has anybody seen one? Okay, so I'm not saying what, we, what our, idea, our ideas are wrong, because I think our ideas are right. I'm not saying that. But we should be careful not to say, this is the way it is. Because we don't know for sure. The, our current idea that we have might be blown out of the water pretty soon. Okay? But for, for, for a long time, this was the Bohr model. And everybody thought, this is what the atom looks like. This is great. We've got all these protons and neutrons hanging out in the nucleus. So what's the charge of the nucleus? Yes, because protons have a charge of what? Q of a proton is, Q stands for charge, by the way. Oh, okay. I know you think that I can't spell, but it's just standard. Yeah. I don't know why they chose Q for charge. It's just, I don't know what the same way as like P for momentum. I don't know. It's just. I guess C was already taken for light. Yeah. I mean, why did, I mean, there's so many things like this, but Q stands for charge, okay? The charge of a proton is positive. 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. How do we know this? Uh, this we do know pretty well, and I'll talk about. We'll talk about that in a second. As uh, we have our physics majors measure this, actually, uh, actually that measure the charge of an electron. The charge of an electron is negative 1.602. 19 coulombs. Okay. So, if this is composed of a bunch of protons, what's this charge? Oh, I didn't write this part. The charge of a neutron is zero. Flat out, absolutely nothing. Zero charge. Plus negative. What's that? Plus negative. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you could say plus zero if you'd like. So uh, it's got protons and neutrons, but the neutrons don't do anything to it. The protons give it the charge. So nonetheless, so this thing here is positively charged. Are you okay with this? Yeah. So just a stupid question, but if they don't have a charge, what do they do with it? How do they stay inside of the Well, charge? this is a beautiful question. Because the next thing we're going to talk about is like charges repel. But you already know this, right? Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. Okay? So if this is a full of a bunch of positive charges, that makes them like charges. Why are they all stuck together? That's because of another force called the nuclear force that only works in very, very close distances. So the nuclear force is very strong, but only if they're very close. If you can split them up a little bit, get them beyond the edge to the limits of the nuclear force, then that electrostatic force kicks in and blows them apart. This would be a nuclear reaction. Okay. It's the name nuclear reaction because you're blowing apart the nucleus. <coughs> now, <coughs> there's a little bit.
bit more to that as well, but I don't want to get into all those details right now. Um, so there we go. So then there's the electrons flying around, and by the way, electrons are negative. And this is the Bohr model that worked very well. We actually have multiple levels of these. So probably more electrons up here. This one might be going in a different direction than the other one. So like the first one's supposed to be two, and the second one's supposed to be, I want to say four or six or something. I don't know. I don't remember. There, there's different energy levels can hold uh, different amounts, yes. I'm still confused about what neutrons actually do. If they don't have a charge, what is the part in the cell? If they don't want it. If neutrons don't have a charge, what is the part in the atom? What do they do? They add mass. All these are massive. These two are almost the same mass. This one's about 2,000 times less than either one of those. Okay. Um, so if they don't have a charge, why don't you have a whole bunch of protons? They do affect the chemical reactions. We don't really know what they are. The neutrons, sorry? Yeah, that's why the whole that's why we have the whole periodic table. You're saying the neutrons that they have to be. Or are you talking about the electrons? Sorry. I'm involved. They, they, <laughs> the neutrons affect what kind of atom it is. Mm -hmm. Which affects its chemical reactions. Okay, yes. So So basically, they're there just add mass, and what do they do with chemical reactions? Do they just like? Well, that's a whole other. Uh, that's a whole other ball. What are they made of? Them, please. What are they made of? Yeah. Or are they just nothing? Okay, so um, we used to think these were the three fundamental particles. We couldn't say what they're made up of because this was it. I mean, it's, it's either a proton, neutron, electron. Well, since that time, we've broken these two up into pieces. We can't break this one up yet. We've broken these two up into pieces, and when we break those up, we get, depending on who you ask, somewhere between 36 and 39, um, what we call fundamental particles. And what we call those fundamental, what, what we, our knowledge of those fundamental particles is very new, and uh, it's changing a lot, so. So, they're just like, Electrons or mini electrons, neutrons, protons? Like yeah. They start with a key like, like There's quarks, uh -huh. bosons, there's fermions. Uh, those are the categories in which these other things. But that, we're, we're talking about stuff, that's another chapter. So yes. we're digressing. We get to cover that then? What's that? Uh, I don't know if this book does or not. I hope so. Um, uh, since Bohr's day, and, and by the way, this guy here, Ernest Rutherford, this new physicist, um, I, I love his quote there. In science, there is only physics. The rest is just stamp collecting. Because fundamentally, that's all physics. How things work, yeah, that's physics. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so here's what Rutherford did. He took protons, actually pairs of protons, and shot them at golden foil. Think about that for a second. How do you get what's foil? Like thin, really, really thin. Like thin metal, right? You can buy aluminum foil from the grocery store. It's the same thing, only gold foil. Okay. And why gold rather than aluminum? Would aluminum foil be cheaper? Yes, it would be much cheaper. But the key is the nucleus of gold is much larger than the nucleus of aluminum. Because it's much more dense? Mm, it just has more protons yeah. and neutrons, so it's a bigger nucleus. And, and the end result is that it does make it more dense, but that's not right. Are the atoms in close proximity? I'd have to look at the crystallographic structure, I don't know for sure. I, I don't I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look yeah. um, but they have large nuclei. And so here's what he did. He, had, he made himself a proton gun, which is kind of cool if you have yourself a proton gun. But he made himself a proton gun, and he was shooting protons at this cold gold foil. And what he found is, some of the protons went right through it. Didn't leave a hole or anything. It just, the protons just, right through it. Some of the protons hit it and bounced over there. 
Some of the protons hit it and bounce back at his gun. And at no point did he break the gold foil. How's he measuring the protons if he couldn't see them? Or, you know, like, how, how, how did he know that they were bouncing? Oh, how did he know they were yeah, bouncing? Yeah, how did he know they were bouncing going through? How did he <coughs> measure if he can't really see it? Or something? How did he know they were bouncing? He knew they were bouncing because he could have, um, well, actually, uh, have you ever seen a TV screen? <laughs> Here's how that works. You shoot charged particles at phosphor and it glows. So, so on the good old-fashioned TV screen, now on the flat screens, it's a little bit bulky, but the good old-fashioned TV screens, there's a coating of phosphor on it. And when you hit that phosphor with a charged particle, it glows. So they hit this spot and glow, and this spot and glow, and you hit all the spots and you draw, draw a smiley face, okay? And then you make the smiley face move, and then you have a TV screen. So black and white, I see. I mean, you can have different colors of phosphor as well. Is that how you get color to you? It took him longer to figure that part out. But nonetheless, it's all the same. So he had phosphor stuff around here. So he, he could see where the glows were. He could say, oh, man, that's what's happening. Okay. Yes. And in so doing, Rutherford figured out, oh, Bohr's idea is right. There's really a nucleus. And it's huge. And this nucleus is charged. Positive. Because the protons that he was shooting at it sometimes bounce back because they were repelled by it. This is a total side. How do you shoot a lot of times? It would go right through this big empty space over here. It only bounced back if it, if it was getting close to the nucleus. So it's a total okay. side. How do you shoot protons? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you shoot protons? You have to ionize, which we can talk about that today too. You have to ionize helium. Not okay. Periodic table. Well, something like that, right? There's all these boxes in here. Yes, yes, exactly. We've all seen this, right? This one over here, number one. Which one's that? Helium or hydrogen? Hydrogen. This okay. one over here is number two. Helium. Helium. What does that two mean? Two electrons. It's got two protons. <laughs> and because helium is naturally neutral, that means it also has two neutrons, or two electrons, okay? So it's got the two protons and two electrons, and if you've got two of those in combination, you have yourself a helium molecule. If you can ionize it, which is a big fancy word that means take away the electrons, then you're left with nothing but There's no, there's no neutrons. It's just two protons and two electrons. What to the neutrons? You take away, what's that? What we'll happened to the neutrons? There weren't any to start with. Sorry. That's what makes it helium. Protons. Oh. Okay. And so this uh, is called an alpha particle. And uh, he actually had an alpha particle gun. It shot pairs of protons, which is the nucleus of a, pro of a helium atom. He had ionized it, and we'll talk about how to do that today. He ionized it, and then, well, how do you shoot something like that? Well, that's easy, because it's a charged particle. All you have to do is set up plates. If something is positively charged, and you want it to come over here, you got this charged particle over here, how do you get it to come over here? We well, just make this thing over here negative, because what do, what do opposites do? So if you make this big plate over here negative, and you've got this positive particle, it's going to go, whoa, negative, and it flies over to it. And then just when it gets there, you make it, you find out that you put a hole right there, and it goes right through, goes right through the other side. And now all of a sudden you make yourself a proton. Okay. Well, what happens if you shot at a person? It would do the same thing it did to gold foil, it would just go right through and or bounce off. Right so it won't hurt you. Yeah, proton guns. They're exciting to talk about, but they really don't do much. <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> okay, does this are you okay with this now? Whew, this is a lot of words to talk about. These things that protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay. Um, what would an ionized hydrogen molecule be? Two protons? No. Uh, helium has two protons. Oh. Hydrogen has one, one. proton. So an ionized proton would be known as a 
I'm sorry, an ionized hydrogen atom would be known as a So why didn't you ionize? I don't really know. For some reason, it's easy for the hydrogen to ionize helium. Why? I, I don't know. The, the chemistry gets involved here. Oh, no, no, no. I meant, um, like, I oh. don't understand why it's a proton. Is it because you're oh, taking oh. away the one you Because proton? hydrogen naturally is one proton and one electron. Mm -hmm. No neutrons. So you ionize it, take away its one electron. What are you left with? Just one. Proton, that's it. Okay. Okay. So we, we could say fundamental particles are protons, electrons, and neutrons. I mean, ionized hydrogen, <laughs> electron, and neutron. That's it. Okay. So, just kind of pop my head. If there's all this open space around, even in the gold atom, just has a lot of. Um, so, so an atom is mostly vacant space. Okay, so here's a question. Why does the air go through our hand? Why does the air go through walls? What? Well, this begs the question, what is air? Well, it's molecules. Yeah. Air is just molecules, random molecules. So what molecules basically is they're just too big to go through the holes in between the atoms. Cool. Gaseous molecules, um, <clears throat> They're, they're moving usually pretty fast, usually spinning, vibrating, and moving. And uh, they tend not to fit through small spaces. So you make a solid object where those gaps are closed down and it just doesn't fit through very much. That's mm -hmm. abstract. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's this, these last few chapters of the book, this is kind of where we're moving. We're moving to less and less of the hard math and more and more of the hard thinking. Yeah. Uh -oh. It's kind of cool, though, in some ways. <laughs> you can math, but you only have to have to think to get the yeah. stuff. Yeah. OK, so how do you ionize? How do you ionize something? OK, so um, I'm going to use this piece of fur here. This is rabbit fur. Yes, a rabbit had to die to contribute to science. And I'm going to take here this plastic tube. Okay, you can tell it's plastic because it doesn't break if I do that. Okay, this is it's acrylic again. So it's a clear plastic tube. And now what I'm doing is by friction, I am charging this plastic tube. I am ionizing the atoms composing the acrylic. Okay, here's what I'm doing. I am stripping electrons from the acrylic. So taking electrons away from it. What does that leave? Just the core. What's that? Um, plastic with a few less electrons. What would make its charge then? Maybe positive. Yes. Everything starts out neutral. Almost everything in the universe, well, speaking of which, this is interesting. Naturally, in the universe, everything is neutral. Okay? What does that mean? It doesn't have positive or negative charge, just it's stationary. Okay? It's got equal amounts of protons and neutrons. Everything naturally has equal quantities of protons and neutrons. Protons and electrons. Now, think about this for a second. What if, say, <coughs> okay, uh, how many molecules are in the body? What are yours? 55 million. A lot more than that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is, but there's a lot of molecules in you. Okay. By the way, just as a side note, if you have more ba bacteria molecules that aren't you in you than you do you molecules in you. That's crazy. That's crazy, but that's a whole other story. We're not going down that road. That's just a side note. <clears throat> the molecules that make you up, uh, we're talking many billions, probably into trillions. Mm -hmm. 
that's a company, I'm not sure that's actually No, it's a actually number. not, it's a number actually. But maybe a newly defined number, but anyway. You have lots of molecules in you. If, 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 if. Say electrons were just a little bit more charged than protons. I mean, we're talking about 25 decimal places down. Just a little bit different. What would that mean your charge would be? If you have equal number of protons and electrons in you. And electrons were just ever so slightly more charged than protons. What would that mean your charge would be? Oh yeah, I said electron, but I wrote proton. Yeah, if protons were more, you would be positively charged. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, how many molecules in your person? 55 million. A lot. A lot. Okay. And even if it was just a little bit, multiply that times 55 billion. Okay? All of a sudden it becomes significant. Okay? See where this is going? It's only don't like but now, right. but let's think about this for a second. If you and you were po both positive, but not only were you and you positive, everything would be slightly positive because everything has equal number of protons and electrons in it. And if electrons were just slightly more, then everything would have a slight, would actually have a significant positive charge to it. We don't. wouldn't just run away, you'd be blown away. You couldn't touch that chair because it would be positive and you'd be positive. You'd be blown away from your chair. You couldn't touch the ground. The whole planet Earth would be extremely positive and we'd be blown, blown right off the planet. I mean, Not the whole only planet that, itself would blow up. <laughs> the whole planet itself would blow up. Not only that, all our atmosphere would be blown Wait a second. Nothing could stick together if either one of these were just a little bit off. So just think, Chrissy, if it's negative, no, it never really makes sense. So here's my point. These two are precisely identical. And people have pondered this. They thought, well, maybe it's not a whole lot. Maybe it's just, and I mean, and they've, and governments have invested billions of dollars into trying to measure precisely the charge of electron and proton. Are they slightly different? To the best of our measurement capability, Why they, they are identical. It's the same. Why would the government care? Why would governments care? If you understand better how the world around you work, the world around you work. The world around you works. You can manipulate it. Manipulating the world around you is useful in lots of different applications. Knowledge is power. Yes. Does this, or, does this make sense? This points to an amazing design feature. Everything has a, exactly equal quantities of protons and neutrons. And those two charges are exactly precisely the same. Which points to a highly engineered system. Anyway, rabbit fur and acrylic. So I'm stripping electrons away. So by doing this, I didn't mean to take off that fur. So I take this and uh, charging this acrylic rod and making the rod what? positive. The charge of the rod is positive because I have stripped electrons from it. What does that make the fur? Negative. Negative. Why? Because it has extra electrons. Okay. Electrons. Now, this thing here is called an electroscope. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to use that one of us. No, this won't zap anybody. Uh, it's not very much fun. And I Sometimes think, you get a zap and you get like, I think, or something. Now, I, I should have warned you that today is really a very fun day. We get to play with lots of fun toys today. But this would be perfect if it was a cold, miserable day in January. Since today is a beautifully sunshiny, with lots of clouds, warm day in March, this is a horrible day to do electrostatics because there's so much humidity. The humidity is the death of all of this.
experiments today. So I'm going to attempt to show you these experiments. They may or may not work today because it's a horrible day for this. Yes, sir. Do you want us to take notes? Yeah. Yes. So I'm charging this by how? There are three ways to charge things. I'm showing you the first way right now. I'm going to jump and say compression. Friction. So I'm, I'm stripping electrons with good old fashioned friction. Okay, I'm just literally stripping them. Okay, and now I'm going to get this hopefully charged plastic rod close to my electroscope. And the electroscope is going to do nothing because today is a horribly human day. See that? Yeah. It yes. moved a little bit. I mean, it's. Sorry, I wasn't looking actually. Okay. Take a note. Let me, let me take away the charge here. Okay. Induction isn't going to work. Okay, so I'm showing you friction, and let me do this quick because. So here's the thing uh, water in the air is a great conductor of electricity. So if we want this to statically stay charged, we don't want anything to conduct onto it. But the fact is the air is full of water. And so, yeah, and so electricity can flow through the air very easily and it will allow the electrons to flow right back onto it. So, so it that, won't stay charged. Is that how things arc? Like, you see, like, yeah. Like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So on a nice dry day when there's, um, like in the middle of winter, wear your socks loosely on your feet and you shuffle your feet across the carpet and you go over and touch somebody and they'll, they'll zap each other because you've built up a static electric, electric charge by rubbing your socks on the floor, charging yourself by friction, and then you go over and touch them and you get close enough and the ele electrons will literally flow from you to them through the air and you can see them ionize the air as it goes across. That's how these work, ionizing the gas inside these, just sending electrons through it. This also back here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Watch it close. It may move a little bit. I didn't see it move. Touching it on this Well, I'm trying to show you induction. Okay, I showed you friction. Induction is not touching. Okay, so if it was working today, here's what would happen. I would. So, okay. If it was working today, if I got it close, this thing is negative. No, sorry. This thing's positive. All the electrons in this metal would flow to the top to get as close to this as they could, because like charges attract. Opposite, opposite charges attract. Okay. So all the electrons that are evenly spaced throughout this would flow up here because electrons are free to flow in metal. Books, not so much. Plastic, not so much. Metal, free to flow. Water? Oh, it's the Perfect water, it's, yeah, not yeah, so much. It's if it's got impurities in it, it can flow pretty easily. Okay, but if it's uh, metal, it'll flow right. Up. All those electrons will flow up here to get in. They'll be congregating that ball, to try to get close to this positively charged rod. Okay, then what will be left down here? No, I mean, yeah. If all the electrons went up here, what will be left down there? Negatively charged. Electrons are positive or negative? If all the electrons leave, what does that leave you with? Positive. Positives. So this part would be positive. So that would tell you that this piece of metal and that little thing that's free to swing back and forth, you see how it swings back and forth real easy? Mm -hmm. That thing would be positive, this would be positive, and they would repel. Yes. Okay. But induction isn't going to work today because the air is too humid. So let me try to charge this real good. See if we can see some induction. Rabbit fur is flying everywhere. It's a little quick. Okay, not gonna work. We'll try conduction. I'm gonna touch it. There we go. So I touched it. And now, by conduction, which is touching, the electrons, <coughs> the electrons that were in here left. They literally flowed onto it and made this closer to neutral 
which left this whole thing positive. And so now that rod is positive, and this thing is positive, and they repel. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, how can we make it go back? Push it? Well, you could force it, yes. Um, touch the bottom? How about, I'm generally neutral. Okay, I've got a lot of protons, neutrons, and electrons in me. So if I touch this, Whoa. because that thing was positive, and I've got lots of new electrons in me, some of the electrons in me just flowed right through and made this neutral again. That's weird. Okay, does this kind of make sense to y'all? Mm -hmm. some other toys. Let's see. Um, something else you might want to be aware of. Uh, and that is um, charges tend to hang out at sharp points. Which is why we have plastic rod up here. This is a hopefully slightly charged acrylic rod. Um, charging the acrylic rod via friction. And let's see if I get this close. I'm not touching it. There's induction for you. Wow. I'm not touching it, but it's being attracted to it. Why? See if I can just slow it down right the other way. Pulling it back. Never even touched it. If you touched it, it would have gone faster. Uh. Well, you tell me. Let's oh God. For a second. Oh. Why are they? Why are they attracted? What is this? If I rub it with the rabbit fur, what is it? Positively charged. This is positive. Yes. Okay. Now this has, what is this? Nothing. It's neutral. What does that mean? It's static. It's the positive negative charge. No, static is not the right word. It's, it's neutral. It's got equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Okay. This is statically charged, more or less, because the electrons have been stripped away and they're not coming back. Okay. Why is this attracted to it? The ones to fix the imbalance. Exactly. The electrons that are in here want to get onto this. This has excess, or this has neutral, so it means it's got some electrons, and this has absence of electrons. So the electrons that are on here want to jump over there and touch it. So now, if I let it touch, what's it going to do? It's going to uh, fix the imbalance. At least try to. So it's going to get some electrons. Here's the catch. These are plastics. Electrons don't flow very well in plastics. So even if they touch, it's not going to do much. If that was metal, however, I think I have a metal rod in here. If it was metal, they would um, they would flow off, and then they would be equal charge. They would be equal charge, but not zero, and then they would repel each other. Can we try it? Yeah, I'll let you play with them in a minute. Um, let me see. Let me play a little bit longer first. Uh, oh, why do they, why do sharp points congregate charges? <clears throat> Here's the corner of a chunk of metal, okay? And you've got positive, equal numbers of positives and neutral, positives and negatives in here. So the charge on the outside of the metal, not the inside? Um, 
No, they're all over. Oh, okay. Any excess charge will, hang, will tend to hang out on the edge, though. Okay. Now, um, what do you notice about these two here? What's closer? These two or these two? I didn't, let me try this a little bit different. What if I flip these? Which ones are closer? <laughs> the ones in the corner or the ones on the straightaway? Looks like the ones in the corner. The ones in the corner are closer. And what do light charges do? Repel. They repel. So, uh, Generator. Is that a little enhancement? Sure. Van de Graaff, capital V, and what's that aluminum pan? Sam, can you go get that aluminum pan? What, sir? Generator. And um, let me put some start from charges on here, or start from peanuts. Turn it on, we'll see what happens. I may not do anything today. It's trying to go to the end. Freshly removed tape. Now stick them together. What you notice about these two pieces? Except for the one that's stuck to the chair. Do you see this? They are repelling each other. Why? Because they aren't happy. Friction. Uh, the friction. Took some of the uh, electrons 
away from it when you when you took it out of the roll and now they're possibly shot. So here's the thing. I know you thought glue was some sort of chemical something or other. And it is. But fundamentally the reason the sticky stuff on tape works is because of electrostatics. It sticks via electrostatics. And in pulling it off the roll, the sticky stuff on the back of the piece of paper, on the back of this plastic, stole electrons from the rest of the roll and made itself negative. So you did the same to the next one. So these two pieces of tape are both negatively charged. Which, why, if you get it close to yourself, it attracts to you because you're neutral. I was wondering why that happens. Okay. So okay. you're neutral and it's attracted to you, but they're both negative, so they're repelled by each other. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I'm going to do something with this. Put a tab on the end. So you need to get it, okay? And stick it to the table. Yeah. Don't do that. I, I, I mean, it's okay, but don't get it messed up. They're easy to mess up. Okay? So you see how I put a tab on the end? Yeah, go ahead. Stick it to the table. So we've got these good and stuck here. Except for my tabs, because I put tabs on the end. Make it flat all the way across. No, stick it. What? Put another one down. Okay. So. Okay, you I don't know if you want me to stick it. Two, um, you want okay. tabs? On oh, uh, just, just tabs. See how I got tabs on here? Oh, I've just okay. got to fold it over so that it doesn't stick, to, so it won't stick uh, to the table. I thought it was like fully different. Let me make it double size. Alright, so you two of them? Uh huh. Now, when I strip these up from the table, what what's going to happen? They are going to be so like, well. What's the glue do? They are going to attract. Close. Try it again. They're going to attract the electrons. They're, they're going to flat out steal. There's no attraction going on. They're just flat out robbers. They're going to steal the electrons from the table. Yes, sir. Okay. So it'll be twice as charged. What's that? So it'll be twice as charged. So they're going to be even more charged. The same. So you ready? So I'm going to take them off the table. Stole electrons from the table, so these are both negatively charged. And if I try to stick them to each other, they just, they really want to stick to me. But they really don't want to stick to each other. That's just cool. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the question. How can you make it so they want to stick to each other? Well, let me show you. Let me show you this. I'm gonna stick this to me for a second, and I'm gonna make them neutral. Remember, I've got a lot of protons, a lot of neutrons and electrons in me. So I'm gonna just by touching it to me, I grounded it. Okay, and so so by doing that, these are roughly neutral now. Okay. Now, when I try to stick them to each other, they're not, there's, there's, there's still a little bit of residual, but they're not nearly as repelled from each other as they were. You see that? Okay, they're neutral. Okay, so here's my question for you. How can we make them be attracted to each other? Uh, stick one to the table, don't stick that one to the table. Like, maybe this one here, then stick okay. this one back to the so table. So make one. Wait, wait, hold on. Make one negative by sticking to the table. And leave the other one neutral. Yes, that should work. Go for it. Make it happen. Should is always something. 
but we can do better than that. Traction there, but not a whole lot. How about this? What was that table when I stripped these off of it? Hmm? What was the charge of the table when we pulled these away from it? Neutral? No. It was neutral, and then we stripped electrons, which left it positive. Positive. Could we apply that principle to these? Because that would be the most attractive, right? Mm -hmm. If one was positive and one was negative? Yeah. How can we accomplish that? Uh, take tape and put tape on the back of one of them and rip it apart. So, take the sticky end of one and put it to the not sticky end of the other and stick them together all the whole length. That's kind of a trick, by the way. I you can do it. Then rip them apart. Okay. Now, rip them apart. Now watch this. Oh, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> See that? Now they're attractive. Because one's positive and one's negative. Of course, I'm still neutral, so they're both attractive to me. Okay? That's fine. Unfortunately, the sticky stuff in Scotch tape doesn't depend on weather. Okay, uh, let's look at this fancy graph generator for a minute. Um, That's the main thing. So the Van de, Graaff, Van de Graaff generator steals electrons from the base, deposits them on the globe, and on a good day, they'll stay there, and the globe will become very negative. And all the styrofoam peanuts will want to leave because they'll all become yeah, negative. Shoot off. Yeah. But it's not a good day today. But it still is building up some charge. So if you come over here and get your uh, hairy knuckles close to it, I have a lot of hair on my knuckles, y'all may not have as much, but, or your arm on your hair, you, you can feel your hair stand up and be attracted to it. If you get close enough, it might be a little sad. So, so do you think that's what ghosts are composed of? Ghosts do not exist. So, so there you go, try to get yourself zapped. Yeah, see you walking in there. One second. Oh. <laughs> you can, we can do that. Grab it for a bit. Oh, there goes one. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there we go. Did you see that? Why is it attracted to me? Oh, did you, you see that? Control. It wouldn't bounce back and forth. Did you see that? Why would it bounce back and forth? Because it gave you its charge and it went back down and got an attraction and came back. It was negative. It flew up, touched me. I'm neutral, so it became neutral. So then it's attracted to the negative, flies back, becomes negative, flies back to me, deposits the negative. You see how this goes, right? Okay, y'all want to play with this. There you go. Her on the rather. Oh wow! You get some induction? Yeah, with the valve. Ah, good. Okay. 